do look and you do listen. Bob Knight commands attention, and most of the time it's intentional. Former Notre Dame head coach and current ESPN analyst Digger Phelps sat down recently with Coach Knight, and the result is a five-part special taking you inside the legend. Here's part one of our Sunday conversation with Bob Knight. If you had to pick out one general with all the military history at West Point and the history of the military, what general really impressed you the most? Grant. Yeah, I think that, that uh, if you study Grant, guy never lost. Uh, they talk about um, Grant as a, as a butcher, that, that the, the North just threw men and men and men in the Civil War. Well, uh, in, in engagements, uh, and this will be fairly close, Grant lost about 10 people per 100 that he engaged in battle. Lee lost damn near 20, uh, 19 maybe. Uh, so Grant lost fewer men. Um, yeah, he, Lincoln made a great comment, you know, somebody was uh, complaining about Grant drinking too much. And, and that's you know, open to conjecture. A lot of that I think is, is probably grossly exaggerated, but Lincoln's comment was, well, find out what he's drinking and send it to the rest of my generals. <laughs> good friend of mine, good friend of yours, said to me, ask Coach Knight why two things are breaking down, you know, you know the, with, with kids today, work ethic and discipline. What has changed worth ethic and discipline? You know, one thing uh, that I think has changed is uh, schools and parents. Like, I teach a class here still in the fall. You know, I mean, it, it in nuclear physics, but it's a class in, in, in teaching and coaching and if you're going to teach school, you got to be there every day. If you're going to coach, you can't miss practices. So I try in this little way to get these kids to understand I can't miss it. I got this class on Tuesday and Thursday morning at 10 minutes after 10, and no matter what, I can't miss it. I mean, I just think I'm doing a little bit for kids by, by making them do that. And, uh, uh, but we, we don't, parents, uh, you were not as demanding with your kids as your parents were with you, nor me with mine. Uh, same thing. And, and, uh, we just, we've lost, too many parents today uh, want kids to really like them, in quotes. You know, well, parents' first responsibility is to get kids to do what they should be doing. And, and, uh, and sometimes that's a tough thing, and it's gotten tougher and tough. Well, Jimmy doesn't have to be in at 10 o'clock. Uh, why do I have to be in at 10 o'clock? Well, the main reason, Johnny, that you have to be in at 10 o'clock is because, God damn it, I tell you to be in at 10 o'clock. And that's it. And my wife was reading an interesting thing uh, last summer. Finally, I said, Karen, what the hell are you reading? She said, I'm reading an article written by a psychologist on today's education and how all this positive reinforcement has been a failure. You know, that's okay, Johnny. You didn't turn your homework in today, but try and turn it in tomorrow. You know, that's like saying, saying, Billy, I know you've missed seven shots in a row, but don't let that bother you. If you get another one, just take it. If you miss 15 in a row, don't, don't. I've never been able to quite get a hold of that approach. And so uh, I think that, uh, I say, well, well, what are they, well, it's, this positive reinforcement. We just got to go back to making demands on kids, she says. And she explains this a little bit further. She kind of moves her glasses down, looks at me over her glasses, and said, you know, you've hung on long enough that you're back in style. <laughs> Let's get to the doghouse syndrome. I, I've had players in Digger's doghouse. Bob Knight has a doghouse, so to speak. Why don't fans understand or players understand this doghouse syndrome? Kids determine who plays. Coaches don't. I mean, you and I don't, you didn't determine who the starting lineup at Notre Dame was going to be, and I don't determine what it's going to be at Indiana. The kids determine that through their play in previous games and their play in practice and their attention to detail and the kids that show you as a coach that they're going to do the best job on behalf of the team. But people lose sight of that. You and I talk, when we talk during the season, we were playing phone tag during a Big Ten conference tournament in Chicago. Finally, we connect the morning of the Purdue game and I didn't like the tone of your voice you were down you were just in that like this is not the Bob Knight I know and you said to me quote I want to talk to you after the season my reaction was are you going to get out of the game are you thinking about getting out of the game 
What was really going through your mind? You know, I think that there's always a time when when you think, boy, is there something else? I, I once told a guy, John Bantz, who's a, uh, a rarity, a good writer for the Indianapolis Star, oh, right. and, and uh, I, I once told him that uh, I couldn't envision myself coaching past 40. And, and so that would have given me about 10 or 11 seasons here. And then that passed. And then uh, I once thought, well, you know, if I ever coach the Olympic team, I wouldn't coach past that. Well, that's 13 years ago. And so I think there have always been times when you think about how much longer you want to coach. I figured it out if, if you do coach six more years here at Indiana and average 20 wins a year, if Jim Phelan doesn't surpass Dean Smith and number of wins, Dean breaking Adolph Ruff's record, Bob Knight could leave the game as the winningest coach in college basketball with number of wins. Are you energized enough to coach another six years? Oh, I could coach another six years, I think, without any question, but, but it would not be for that reason. I mean, I'd like to leave college basketball having caught more fish than anybody that's ever <laughs> coached college basketball. And so the what what keeps me coaching is simply what I've talked about how much I enjoy the game, uh, how much I like trying to put the next game plan together. If you give something, I think, to the game, if you give what you've got to it, and, and you sit down and think, you've gotten back a hell of a lot more than you've given to it. For more on Bobby Knight, log on to ESPN.com. You can read dozens of your fellow fans' memories and impressions of Coach Knight's career. Sunday Conversation has been brought to you by Spring. That's just big time TV production again. Our inmate's not retiring or anything. We're just doing a big TV story on him. Tonight, in part two of five, the Indiana coach takes us back to the days when he wasn't the Indiana coach, and he speaks of his affection for those he met along the way. West Point, was Parcells there with you? Yeah, he came uh, the second year I was the head coach. And you guys just hit it off right oh, away. Oh, we're the same day, same, same goddess of the skies. I don't, I don't know whether it was uh, was uh, Al Michaels or uh, Deardorff that said uh, on a Monday night broadcast that there was no institution in the world big enough that if those two guys were at it, they wouldn't find one another. When Parcells and I talk, you know, there's always a change in his voice when they've won or lost. And, and, and I think that uh, guys that really care, you or me or Bill or uh, who, the guys that really always kind of feel that way. You've always had this ability to respect those who've been through it, and, and you just really got close to all these guys. Then while other kids would be going to movies or going out on dates or whatever, I was going with guys. My coaches were always good. And when I got into coaching, uh, I just figured, well, who can tell you the most about coaching? Well, it's somebody that's been in it forever. And those are three, uh, three great names uh, for me, uh, B and, and Iva and Newell. And then, then uh, three others are Lapchick and, and, and Auerbach and Everett Dean. And, and those six people I spent an awful lot of time talking to and, and, and being around. Hank Iva, the 84 Olympic team, which we assembled here in Bloomington, you had him around that team, not just because he was Hank Iva, but for another reason. Well. I thought that, that we really got jobbed in the 72 Olympics in 1972. He was 68 years old, and he had already coached two outstanding Olympic teams, and they loved him, and they get around him. And I, Alvin Robertson's got his arm around him as he's talking to the kids, and he looked, in the, looked at him, and he said, all right, he said, we got to go out and play defense, and we got to block out, and we're just going to beat their ass. Let's go. And I thought that was one of the great, one of the great lead-in speeches I'd ever heard to play it. That night we have the inner squad scrimmage, and there's 19,000 people downstairs. Move Jordan to the guard, and we're going like, you don't have to worry about a backup guard. You got Jordan playing guard. Or 
defense and offense. I told a very good friend of mine who had a draft pick that year that was pretty high in the NBA, and I said, you got to take Jordan. Well, we need a center. I said, play Jordan at center. What difference <laughs> does it make? I said, I don't care what you need, play him where you need him, but just get him. And they didn't take him and, and, and took a guy that just didn't last very long in the NBA. And I mean, and I meant that. I mean, I wasn't trying to emphasize that this guy's a hell of a player. I'm just saying play him at center because nobody can guard him at center. He can probably guard most of those guys. Let's get to Larry Bird. A lot of people don't realize that Larry Bird was from French Lick, small town, came to IU, but really before basketball even started, decidedly. I don't think he was really ready to go to school at that time. I, I just don't think that that wherever he would have gone, and I wasn't as attuned to what his needs uh, were as a kid as I should have been. You know, I kind of hold myself. Did you recruit him? Oh, yeah. And, and I, he had a scholarship. I, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, he, I thought he had the best hands of any kid I'd ever seen, the best hand-eye coordination. He's only 6'6 six, six and weighed about 180 pounds at that time. And by the next summer, he was 6'9 and weighed 225 or 230, so he had that much growth after he graduated from high school. But I was not as attuned to what his needs as an individual were as I should have been. And Larry went back home and then obviously went on to Indiana State and had a tremendous career in the pros. I think that Bird epitomizes what a guy can do with what he has if he's willing to work at it. But in college, when he went to Indiana State, it set up that dream game, so to speak, with the other guy, Magic Johnson who obviously at Michigan State only for two years. One of, the, one of the premier college players you ever coached against? Johnson was very good. Uh, in college I, now? I thought he was extremely good in college. Lucas is the best player in my mind that's ever played in the Big Ten. Uh, you think of Lucas's stats, he averaged 17 plus rebounds a game for three years. I mean, nobody ever gets 17 rebounds in a game anymore. He averaged that. Johnson was one of the really premier players that's played, but Johnson played for a coach, Judd Heathcote, that used him extremely well, used what he had really well, and they were just, by the time the NCAA tournament came around that year, they were a pretty dominant team. Let's talk a little bit about Dean Smith and, and what he's accomplished and you know what he was for college basketball, a real innovator. I, Dean was a real student in the game of basketball, and, and uh, Dean and I have always been good friends. We don't necessarily think exactly the same way on it, but pretty close. He w has a, had a really keen mind, um, a really good uh, uh, appreciation and understanding of, of the game, but on top of all that, uh, he did what college coaches should do. He graduated players. He had players that, that went on to do all kinds of things other than play professional basketball. They added to society. They didn't detract uh, from it. He's been one of the really uh, very top key people in basketball during the time that I've been in it. I mean, as good as anybody. You know, you can log on to ESPN.com.